Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, clerk, will you call the roll? And with noting that the council president is here. He's walking in. Corliss. Here. Holly Burton. Here. Morales. Here. Said. Here. Willits. Here. All present. Thank you. All right, we've got a whole bunch of updates today. The first one is an update on our accessory dwelling units overview and trends that we're seeing. Uh, Crystal, thanks for joining us. This is, um, this is we've touched upon this a couple times and councils said that they were interested in hearing what's different, what's changed since the, the modern zoning code went into effect because we are seeing quite a few applications. So ask Crystal to come in and share information on where we're at. Can't hear you. There we go. Happy to do it. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, I'm Crystal Rain. I'm the Planning and Zoning Manager for PDS, and I am going to give you a brief update on accessory dwelling units and kind of some of the trends we've been seeing. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice might give up. <clears throat> a few topics I'll cover today is um, changes to ADU requirements from legacy code to modern zoning code, the general process a citizen goes through um, when they're applying for an ADU, ADU permitting trends over the last couple of years, um, where we are now with ADU statuses and applications, permit processing times under the new code, and then I'll be happy to answer any outstanding questions you might have after that. So again, starting with what has changed, we actually made just a few modest changes to the ADU ordinance, which are really having a big impact. Uh, we started by removing the owner occupancy requirement. Under the legacy code, ADUs were only allowed on properties where the owner resided. Um, this was enforced through a deed restriction, recorded with the county, and it was attached to the permit file. And as you can imagine, this really limited the pool of uh, potential applicants that could um, have one of these. We also increased the maximum size from 700 square feet to uh, 900 square feet, contingent on the ADU um, square footage not exceeding the square footage of the primary structure. And then finally, we removed the requirement for ADUs to provide any additional parking, um, which would have been required for any two bedroom units under the legacy code. Now, these changes were informed by feedback we heard directly from the community during the 2021 tiny home uh, and trailer ADU pilot, which we'll be hearing a little bit more about next, so good timing. Um, we heard citizens saying that they really wanted to be part of the solution in terms of uh, the housing crisis, but some very specific barriers were keeping them from doing so. As far as process goes, um, ADU applications remain in administrative review um, as a type two. Here you can see the general process starting as all applications do with early assistance. And this is where the develop, uh, development services team or uh, the customer facing wing of the planning division determines the project type and then a PLN case is created. Uh, a PLN is not the application number, but it's a more of an umbrella case number where we assign projects that are in pre-application submittal phase. This is a very fast project for smaller projects like this um, and are frequently combined with concept review, which is where we look at the project at a, you guessed it, concept review level. Um, and we try to identify any red flags or possible issues. Some examples of what we look for at this point are platted easements, um, infrastructure service, access, or if a parcel is in one of our overlays, such as historic, um, airport influence area, or hillside. We have this cute little cheat sheet of things to go over, so we make sure that the review is consistent uh, across all the planners. Um, now, this is not meant to be a comprehensive review of any projects, but more of an, an opportunity to identify any issues early in the process, theoretically before folks have invested substantially in any final design uh, or plans. <clears throat> After concept review, the project will be added to the development tracker, and this is when it would show up in any of those um, weekly update emails that you get for signing up for uh, the development tracker. And this is also the point when a customer would be able to submit for the actual application. Now, to appreciate the surge of interest that we're seeing in ADUs, now let's take a look back at the last couple years starting in 2021. Um, this was the year we saw the largest number of overall planning submittals since 2000. Um, that year, we had 82 ADU applications, followed by 71 in 2022. Now, 2023, we did see a slowdown in ADU applications and uh, applications overall, um, with 36 submitted under legacy code and an additional 12 submitted under the modern zoning code um, for a total of 48. Now, we believe this was either due to folks waiting for the changes in the new code or could have been a result of those larger market forces we saw last year. Um, with inflation and interest rates spiking, folks very well could have um, put these types of projects on the back burner until conditions improved. <clears throat> Finally, uh, looking at the first three months of 2022, we've already seen uh, 
received nearly more uh, ADU applications than in all of 2023, and then more than half the total volume in 2022. So if this rate continues, we could receive well over 100 ADU cases this first year. Um, one note on these numbers, these applications were not all necessarily approved. Uh, these uh, also represent actual applications, not PLNs, which I will talk about more in just a moment. Um, this data is for total ADU PLNs beginning December 1st, 2023, um, and then going to March 28th, 2024. We've had 101 ADU PLNs since the adoption of the modern zoning code. Um, as you can see, the North End has a higher share of these applications, followed by neighborhoods on the central bench. Uh, here is a breakdown of where those PLNs are in the process. 22 applications are either sitting at early assistance or concept review. 30 have completed concept review and are eligible to submit an ADU application at any time. And then 24 are in active review with the planning and zoning team with 25 having been approved already. Moving into permitting times, on average, it's taken 43 days for someone to get their ADU application from when they start the PLN process to when their application is approved. Now, the average days it takes are getting faster though, and in February, it took an average of 35 days um, nothing had been approved yet in March when we pulled these numbers, but as you can see, we are trending downward. For context, before the adoption of the modern zoning code, uh, ADU applications took 30 days on average to complete um, from application submittal through approval or denial. And so the timeframes here on this slide include pre-submittal activities as well as that review time. So I think we're doing pretty good there. Um, and with that, stand for any questions. Thank you. Kathy, I'll just go down the line. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you so much for this information. This is great news. Um, I think it's a great way to stand up some affordable housing in the areas. One quick question. Do we know once these are approved, um, if they are gonna be for a short-term rental or if they're actually gonna be for housing? Madam Member, Council Member, that's a great question. Um, we do not have that information. We do not ask for that um, during the application process. And so that is data we don't have. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, so when we get ADU proposals, we usually see like one of two different things. Um, one, like we'll hear tonight, uh, it'll be somebody who's building a new ADU. There wasn't anything existing there and they have to meet all the new setbacks um, and all those, all those different types of things. And then the other ADUs that we see, um, especially up on the central bench or the north end, and the east end where the houses are a little bit older are like a pre-existing garage um, or a pre-existing structure that's actually probably out of compliance, you know, as far as setbacks go. So it's non-conforming. Is there any difference when people are applying for an ADU for something new where they have to meet all of these setbacks? Or if they're converting something old, an old existing structure, do they still have to bring those into our modern setbacks? Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Halle Burton, um, that is, uh, it, it depends, uh, is kind of the answer on all of these things. Um, if it is a non-conforming but can be established legally, then we would just have them go through that legal non-conforming process um, at, in tandem. Sometimes we'll um, process those in the same application um, just to establish that had been existing um, before the uh, previous code. Um, uh, sometimes it would require a variance to uh, expand that or to increase the intensity of it, but it's really case by case. But we have a path forward for really any of those situations. Great. Thank you. I know that that's one of the areas that I, as we do explore this kind of going forward in the future, I'm really interested in these places that have stuff that are non-conforming right now, um, our ability to not have to tear a structure down or make people jump through additional hoops and trying to figure out where there's some flexibility. So um, that might be something that we can look at as we continue down this road. Thank you. Do you have anything? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question as it exists with homeowners associations. So I know that there was a low number. I think there was just two in District 1. We have a lot of homeowner associations out in West Boise. Um, I'd like clarity on the policy, and maybe you can phone a friend with the council president who worked on this. If the CCNRs say you can't do an ADU, is that the end? There's just there, that's the That's the letter of the law. Madam Mayor, Council Member Willits, uh, more or less, yes. Okay. The, that agreement um, exists outside of any of our processes. We don't hold those that's held with the county. And so it'd be contingent on the applicant to 
work with their homeowners association to amend those. Got it. All right, that looks like it. Thank you. Just on time. Perfect. <laughs> that was definitely on purpose. All right. Um, and now Kyle Patterson is joining us um, to share an update on the tiny homes and um, homes on wheels pilot project that um, I just want to remind folks and he might as well this these were this came out of an innovation process that city staff across a whole bunch of departments worked on crowdsourced ideas from the public. Um, Kyle and his team Sam is here. Uh, please wave Sam hello um, took this ran with it and is here to provide uh, an update on where we're at and what we've learned. Those are pretty. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, my name is Kyle Patterson. I'm the Director of Innovation and Performance, and I'm joined here today by uh, Brian Woodward as well, who's the Chief oh, Operating sorry. Officer uh, for LEAP Housing. And as the Mayor mentioned, we're going to be sharing some updates on the two housing pilots we have underway. Um, but because this has been my first opportunity to present to Council in a while, I wanted to take the opportunity to share a little bit more about my role and my work. Um, you know, whenever somebody asks me what my title is and I say, oh, I'm the director of innovation and performance, I always get the same response, which is first like, oh my gosh, that's such a cool title. And they follow it up with, but like, what do you actually do? Like, what's your job? And I get why, because I know they're sort of buzzwordy words, but in reality, innovation and performance are functions that have been around in city government across the country for 15 or 20 years now, which is great because they've been around long enough to know that they work and that they add value. And they were born because cities are facing increasingly complex challenges, as you all know, right? Things like housing affordability, things like climate action. These are challenges for which there's no silver bullet. Um, and of course, we should be seeking out best practices. We should be seeking out uh, evidence-based policies wherever we can. But to really be successful at tackling those big, hairy, complex, wicked challenges, right? We also need to get creative. We need to experiment with new solutions. We need to experiment with new problem solving approaches and we need to get better at leveraging data for impact. And that's really what my job is all about. Just one quick example, as you all know, the city has a climate action plan which sort of charts the course to achieving our very ambitious carbon neutrality goals. One whole chapter of that climate action plan is titled innovation because we recognize that what we know most of the stuff we need to do to get there, we still need to innovate to really achieve that goal. Um, and this just really quickly is the approach that I try and use in all of my work, this build, measure, learn approach, right? We want to build something new. We want to experiment. We want to innovate with something. But then data is a core piece of that, right? We have to measure success to know if it's working and then learn from that. And sometimes in innovation, things don't work, right? So you might have to decide, do I want to persevere with this? Do I want to make a tweak to this idea and then start that cycle again and see if it'll work? Or do we need to say, you know what, this, this idea just isn't going to work. We need to pivot to something else. And that's always something that I'm thinking about. Uh, and then just again, really quickly, a few projects I've worked on over the past year and a half. This is definitely not a comprehensive list of projects, but I think they're illustrative of some of the variety of work that I do. Um, this is the Child Care Licensing Process Innovation Project, which is really hard to say without stuttering. I'm glad I did that. And Sam Beck, who's amazing, led this work. Obviously, child care is a, a, a big part, uh, really important to our community, but we heard from in-home child care providers that our licensing process just took too long. It was really confusing. It was really expensive. So we uh, partnered closely with the clerk's office, with code enforcement, um, with PDS, uh, with Central District Health even, to try and streamline that process. And we found a number of innovations that we're working to implement now that when they're fully implemented, we'll be able to reduce that licensing time from over 90 days to what it was before to under, we think, under 30 days. We were also able to reduce fees by $230 just because through streamlining the process, it now takes less staff time to process those applications, which means we can charge less money. So that's just a really great example of a win for us in the community. Uh, another project we did about a year ago was a staff innovation challenge where we uh, invited staff to submit ideas that would advance city goals. Um, really, really impressed with all the staff engagement we got. We got almost 700 ideas, almost a quarter of city staff participated in the challenge. And we selected almost 60 ideas to be implemented. Just one example idea that was selected is the compost cam you can see up there. Um, it used to be that if you wanted to go pick up compost from a city site, you had to like go out there and hope there was compost there or call or email city staff. And staff had this great idea of like, what, do we, what if we just put a webcam up and put it on the website? That way residents can see before they make the trip out, is there compost there? Obviously a much better customer experience, but also better for our staff because they're having to feel fewer calls and emails. So just a really great, simple, low cost solution that we got because we listened to our staff and their creative ideas.
And then one other quick project that I'm working on right now, obviously in close partnership with PDS, it's come up a little bit already today, is I'm leading efforts to evaluate the modern zoning code. Um, as you all know, good policymaking doesn't end at a vote, right? It's a continuous process. And we wanna bring that sort of build, measure, learn approach to our modern zoning code. Um, I had a conversation with a housing economist at, um, at Brookings, I think last year, and I asked her, who are the cities that are doing this well, that are making zoning code changes and then bringing data into the conversation and evaluating that and making changes as a result? And her answer was nobody, no city's doing this well. So I'm really excited for this work because it's an opportunity to use data to improve our community, obviously, but also I think it's a real good opportunity to be a leader in the country and be something that other cities look to um, for how we use data for impact. So thank you for allowing that digression. I'll actually get to our actual topic today, um, which are the two housing pilots that we have underway. Uh, as Mayor mentioned, we uh, participated a couple years back in an innovation program through Bloomberg Philanthropies in which we deeply engaged the community in coming up with creative solutions to address housing affordability. It was really fun. We got a ton of ideas that I thought were all great, but two ideas really rose to the top in terms of community interest, in terms of likelihood of impact, and those are the two ideas that we are piloting currently uh, in close partnership with Leap Housing. Um, the first one is around movable tiny homes. These are also called uh, tiny homes on wheels. You've probably seen them on um, any number of cable television shows on Instagram. They're pretty glamorous these days. They're small, under 400 square feet. They sit on a trailer on wheels so they can be moved from one site to another. And they use typical housing material. So they look more like a, a traditional home than an RV. Um, but they're currently not legal in Boise city limits as a housing unit outside of an RV park. And what we heard from the community is like, maybe this is a viable low cost housing option that if you allow these tiny homes on private property, somebody to live there with the right circumstances, it might work really well. And so we're currently piloting um, that, that idea. Um, we're uh, hoping to get up to five sites where homeowners will host a tiny home on their property. And then we're partnered with the Idaho Policy Institute at Boise State to evaluate and gather data on that pilot to inform a potential future policy change there. Um, the second idea we're piloting is around accessory dwelling units, which Crystal talked to you so you know all about. Um, one of the things we learned through our uh, user testing in this process was that there are a lot of homeowners out there who they wanna be part of the solution around housing. They really wanna build an ADU, but they're also really intimidated. They, they don't know how to navigate city permitting process. They don't know how to find a contractor. They've never been a landlord before, and it's a really big barrier for them. And so the idea for the pilot was, well, what if we give a small financial incentive to homeowners, but then a lot of technical assistance and support and working through those barriers, but in exchange, we asked them to rent out their ADU at an affordable rate for a period of up to 10 years. And when I say affordable, I'm talking about 80% of area median income. So just at a high level, those are the two pilots that we're working on now. Um, I'm gonna invite um, our guest, Brian Woodward from LEAP to come up and share a little bit more uh, about progress to date and any lessons learned that we have. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here, Madam Mayor and council members. Uh, first time here. So um, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, to participate in the learnings and successes of both sides of the pilot exercise. Uh, starting with the tiny homes on wheels, um, one, one point of clarification, if you're really familiar with the code, there's also tiny homes that are on permanent foundations. That's not what these are. These are movable, they're meant to be moved. Um, there's an outpouring of support and interest uh, through minimal marketing efforts. Uh, probably more than 100 people reached out in a very small amount of time uh, when we initially launched. And um, we still have a number of people that continue to be interested. Currently, we have about five to 10 individuals that are currently undergoing a site feasibility analysis. We've learned that not all sites are created equal. Uh, most importantly, if you already have some utility hookups that are available, this makes financial feasible sense for you. Um, and so that's one of the key learnings that we've had. Uh, additionally, uh, working with the city staff has been pretty great. Uh, I think uh, one of our responsibilities as people who can walk alongside home buyers, uh, and ho not just home buyers, but uh, people who might potentially be landlords, is to help them understand and see that it's really easy to talk to city staff to ask your questions about what do I need in order to do a sewer clean out? Uh, what do I need to do in order to have temporary uh, potable water sources? Uh, and those answers are just a phone call away. 
uh, all of the staff was more than willing to provide their cell phone and contact information. And it's also encouraging to know that like inspections can happen same day. Um, if you might do something at 11 a.m. and you can have an inspection done at 5 p.m. That's encouraging to homeowners and potential landlords for the speed uh, to execute. Uh, today, we have one tiny home on wheels that is currently installed. Uh, it's off of Fort Street. Uh, the person who is occupying the tiny home bought their tiny home uh, because they wanted to have a long-term equity solution for their household of four people. Um, it's, uh, it's been a pretty big success uh, in terms of getting it there, uh, as well as them being happy. Uh, the head of household works downtown, so they're able to save funds uh, by just walking to work and commuting to work that way. So that works out really well for that household as well. Uh, we've learned a little bit about what it takes to move a movable tiny home. Uh, pulling it in or backing it in is a real serious constraint that as part of the technical assistance that we guide people on, rear alley access is the best uh, in most situations. Um, this, uh, we've also had another uh, piece of feedback recently come in, somebody who wants to be uh, a landlord. They're not currently a landlord in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that is one of the other pieces of feedback that we've been able to collect is we do have a lot of landlords who are already landlords that are very interested. They understand the infrastructure and all of the ins and outs of renting to someone. Uh, and then we also have people who are just regular citizens. They want to be part of the solution. Uh, and I quote, uh, what a practical solution to a real community need. And so like those are the types of folks that are coming forward and that we get to walk alongside and that are interested uh, the other success for the tiny home that is there currently is it has wintered successfully. And what I mean by that is uh, something that is allowable and is helpful for people to access is uh, you can just hook up a hose to the hose bib to the primary dwelling as long as it has a heat trace, which is pretty typical uh, of RV uh, locations uh, where you have those kinds of temporary dwellings and there's no water freezing. We're always concerned about health and safety as well as making access accessible, if you will. Um, so some of the other learnings, uh, we've talked a little bit about the su site suitability findings uh, versus cost feasibility findings. Not all sites are created equal. We've had a few um, potential landlords that were interested in a tiny home village, but it was wanted to, they wanted to do it on unimproved land, which was cost prohibitive. Uh, we do have some grant funding, but not enough uh, to do like a hot sewer tap, for example, uh, for more than uh, one location. Um, additionally, uh, if it has a 50 amp service, uh, and in addition to what it already has as the primary dwelling, that'll make costs a lot more affordable for somebody. If they don't have that, that's a non-starter. That's also one of the very uh, serious things that we want to respect from a health and safety perspective. We want to respect that in all situations um, to make sure that the electrical is going in uh, in an A-plus fashion. Um, so, the, the other thing that's next is uh, we wanna, we've learned that there's definitely a lot of interest in the community about the concept. Um, it's, it's neat, it's, it's buzzworthy, it's trendy. As Kyle said, it's on a lot of TV shows, uh, but we want to help people take the next step. And part of what we have to do in taking that next step is creating a marketplace. Uh, there's no shortage of people that want to be landlords, but it's very difficult so far to get people to raise their hand and say, I have a tiny home and I would like to live here, or I have a tiny home and am living here already. Uh, those folks have not raised their hand uh, due to the fact that they would kind of like put themselves on the map, if you will. And this would only be legal at the moment for 12 to 18 months. So some of the work that we're doing right now in conclusion is just building that marketplace where we can introduce potential folks with tiny homes already to willing landlords that want to accommodate them. So I'll move on to the ADU side of things. Um, again, there's no shortage of interest. Uh, a lot of people wanted to be involved, and this was before uh, the code change. Uh, we had a successful open house, had an existing tiny home. Uh, we had a chosen builder who would work with every single person who was interested. Uh, at least a dozen households meaningfully considered participating in the pilot, but for various reasons, they backed out, mostly because the cost of construction materials increased quite a bit. Uh, during the pilot, uh, as well as interest rates. Um, and uh, we, we did have some folks who were mission-minded and had the means to do it, uh, but they, uh, they would want to do it, but they did not want to restrict themselves to an 80% AMI rent for 10 years. Uh, so that's, I think, also meaningful feedback. Um, so what's next? 
uh, I think it's important as we move into this next phase of life uh, as a real estate economy uh, to keep our pulse on the, the community of business owners that have emerged over the past few years that do ADUs specifically and only ADUs, as well as movable tiny homes and only movable tiny homes. These were once kind of fringe industries, but now they're becoming more mainstream. And I think some public-private partnership is probably part of what could happen in the future. Thank you. Ben Mary, I got a quick question before you step down. You said one of the site constraints, I think, is the sewage and then the 50 amp. When you say constraints, I mean, are we talking like $10,000 constraints for like a sewage hookup and installing a 50 amp? Like what's the, what's the cost burden of bringing something like that on if it doesn't exist? Uh, a rough estimate for electrical, um, just uh, in a, on a happy path scenario, would be twenty five hundred to five thousand uh, dollars to introduce the electrical requirements for sewage. It's a little bit harder to say if you wanted to do a permanent sewer line. It could be ten thousand dollars. It just depends how how much uh, how many linear feet you're going to have to bring that new sewer line. But the more cost effective way around it for a temporary pilot is to install a sewer clean out. Um, which is a, a more uh, relatively a, a modern, um, not an invention, but it's a, it's it makes it a lot easier for plumbers to like clean out sewer lines uh, from the exterior of a home rather than going inside the home to go through uh, the toilet, if you will. Great, thank so, you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. I think Kyle's got something yeah. to say to that, Madam Mayor. Council member, just to add to that, the real barrier is because this is a temporary pilot, right? The cost of the infrastructure is probably not going to be a huge barrier if you can have a tiny home there for 20 years, right? Because you're thinking about long-term rental revenue. When it's a, a temporary pilot for 12 to 18 months, then the cost of the infrastructure really becomes a big barrier to participating because you want to make sure you're recouping those costs, knowing that in 18 months, you, that tiny home may not have to move and you can get any more, you can't get any more rental revenue. And I'd say, too, with all this, from the learnings from these pilots, uh, that's that'll come back to us with a policy discussion. If if there are programs that we believe um, weren't continuing, they, they seem to be working, then what do we need to do to make them used more by residents is where we can all engage. Madam Mayor, I would love to know, so if we're having what additional learnings are we hoping to gather from folks who agree to this pilot? Like what more needs to be learned, I guess, before we can consider a policy discussion? Madam Mayor, Council Pro Tem. Um, so Idaho Policy Institute is leading the evaluation piece and there's gonna be a number of pieces of data they're gonna collect. Um, everything from what do the neighbors feel about this tiny home in the next yard to collecting the financial data, like how much did it actually cost to do this? And is it actually affordable after you put in all the hookups? to what was the experience of the tenant and the landlord with working in the situation. So they're gonna be gathering all of that information. On the ADU side, I think what we've come to the conclusion for is that just the pilot just doesn't work. We're at a pivot point, right? Just the financial market conditions aren't there to make it work right now. I think um, the, the participants would have still done it if the city was offering some large financial incentive, but I just don't think the cost benefit is there for that. But I think our pivot point on the ADUs is that we learned a lot from this work about what are the barriers to building an ADU that we can use to inform future city efforts around that. And so Idaho Policy Institute will bring some of that information back as part of the evaluation there. And what, and what I've asked staff to do is once we have that evaluation available, um, that we have that discussion as well as some proposed policy changes, incentives, creation, et cetera, um, for programs that we might move forward with. Thank you. And I have more, if that's yep. okay, Madam Mayor. All right, so based on the success of that first tiny home that we have cited, um, we are expanding the pilot program to include recreational vehicles, RVs on private property. Uh, and just a point of note that um, RVs already allowed as temporary housing in several parts of Idaho. So in Jim County, um, in the cities of Haley and Ketchum. And I recently talked to a resident who lives in West Boise um, her sister-in-law got cancer uh, and racked up medical bills. So her brother and sister-in-law lost their home because they could no longer allow uh, afford housing costs as a result of all the medical bills. She had a large backyard. She had an RV pad already there with hookups for water, sewer, et cetera. Her brother moved in to her backyard in the RV and she thought it was a really great safe situation for her family and a good opportunity for her brother to have affordable housing. He was helping with the property. 
but then a neighbor complained and um, code enforcement was involved. And now the brother's going to have to find another place to live and he doesn't know what he's going to do. And the resident's point in her experience was, this was a really great situation. This person, my brother really needed housing. I had this great option for him, but the city doesn't allow this. And so that sort of inspired this idea of a pilot around recreational vehicles on private property. Should we consider allowing them as, as temporary housing? And so we're moving forward with a pilot um, very similar to the tiny home on wheels pilot. Um, and the goal really here is to learn, like what information do we need to inform a decision about whether we might allow this? Um, it would only be allowed on developed private property like somebody's backyard, right? Um, we would hopefully recruit five to seven property owners who would be willing to do this to host a recreational vehicle for up to 18 months. Again, similar to the tiny homes. We would have some really reasonable health and safety requirements in place, like you have to have appropriate electrical connections, you have to have an improved parking surface. Uh, we wouldn't allow any short-term rentals, right? It'd be for, more for long-term rentals. And again, the goal would be that Idaho Policy Institute would evaluate this, gather data on those things to inform a possible policy decision in a, in a year and a half or so from now. Um, so next steps as we see them, um, LEAP is planning to launch that RV pilot and start recruiting participants for that and to continue recruiting participants for the tiny home pilot. Uh, and But then I'm excited to come back to council this summer and I think we'll have enough data to start a conversation about policy around tiny homes. One, we'll have um, Idaho Policy Institute's uh, sort of initial report on the ADUs in the first tiny home, which will be really great data. And then also something that's happened since we started the pilot is Haley, Idaho passed an ordinance allowing people to live in tiny homes on wheels. And they already have a handful that have been permitted. So I think they have some really good learnings from their experience there. Um, so far, it's gone really well for them. They don't have any complaints from neighbors. I, I guess their um, fire department actually put in a tiny home on wheels in the parking lot of, the, of a, a fire station because one of their firefighters didn't have housing and needed housing. And they're finding it's really positive. So I can bring all of that information back from learnings from our pilot and from Haley to have a conversation with council then. And of course, we're disappointed that the ADU pilot just didn't work. That's sort of part of innovation, right? Sometimes things don't work. But again, I think we collected a lot of good information that will inform future efforts. Um, so that completes my presentation. I'm happy to stand for questions. One specific area where I'd welcome council feedback and guidance is as we're embarking on these pilots and these evaluations, what sort of information and data would be helpful for us to collect to help you make uh, informed policy decisions? You can see some of the stuff that we're collecting data on right now, level of community interest, what do neighbors think, et cetera. But uh, do those sound like the right list of things? Are there other pieces of data we should be tracking to help you make a good decision? Thank you. Madam Mayor, just a quick comment. Um, one. Thanks for all the hard work. Um, thanks for exploring all these areas. Also, thanks for the community of practice work that you're doing with AI. So more great stuff that Kyle's working on. I guess I would say the biggest difference that I see between a tiny home and an RV is like how Instagrammable it is. Like they're kind of the same thing. Like if they've got a toilet system, if they've got working electrical. So the only thing that I guess my concern would be is, if, is there a safety concern? And in a lot of situations, I would say that if somebody's manufacturing an RV, they're probably doing it in a very professional way if it's still working versus even somebody who's building a tiny home. So like that could be somebody doing it with their, their own hand. So as long as they're meeting the same safety concern, I don't see a large issue. So as far as council guidance and things to look at would be is if we're seeing any safety issues with older RVs versus a newer tiny home or, you know, those types of health concerns. Other than that, I don't really see a, a big difference between the two. Madam Mayor, council member, thank you. Did you have Madam Mayor, um, to follow up with that, I think one good benefit of tracking with the RVs versus um, maybe a tiny home is the RVs are suitable with washout tanks, with a water tank on board, with a sewage tank, a black tank to be pumped out. And there's companies in town that pump that out. So it solves a problem that uh, some of our ADUs and the tiny homes are running into. So I I'm really supportive of this pilot and look forward to seeing what kind of feedback we get. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I'd be really curious kind of the um, any data that we can find in terms of the transient nature of these. So, you know, if someone has a suitable area for a tiny home on wheels or RV, um, would they expect to have the same exact tiny home on wheels or RV in that spot for what period of time? 
um, how that turnover looks and how that kind of is managed. I'd be really curious about that because that's like the one difference, right, is that you can swap them out or uh, someone that owns one of these could mo take a job in a new city. And hopefully that city has, you know, similar um, abilities to be able to, to house that tiny home on wheels. So kind of curious about what that transition, you know, that um, turnover might look like. Thank you. Madam Mayor, um, I, I have a question about the, so is there anything that says about the RV situation? Does it need to be maintained as like street safe with registration and working wheels and things like that? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Pro Tem, all of those things. And we have a, we'll have a set of requirements that folks will have to adhere to, which include has to be registered. It has to be operable, mm -hmm. right? You have to be able to move it in and out of the site. We're defining RVs. Um, as like uh, an RV, a motor home, a trailer, but not like a pop-up trailer with soft sides, not like a, a camper shell on a truck. So it will be, uh, you know, um, RVs that are appropriate to be lived in. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to just as a comment, just say that I, I think that this innovation and the partnerships that you're building is really wonderful. I think each, you know, it's going to take so, so much effort and so many different ideas to help us get ahead of this housing situation that that not only the city of Boise is in, but really we're seeing across the whole country. So I applaud the work that's going on here um, and the the just all of the, I think it's really great that you're leaning on other communities for their learnings too. Um, and so thank you so much for all this good work. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kyle. Uh, thanks for the update on the programs that have happened and I appreciate the partnership that we've got with LEAP. So thanks for being here. Um, and looking forward to hearing updates this summer and having that policy discussion. All right, and Andrea is with us to check back in on the valet parking ordinance. Our intent is to have a first reading of the ordinance next week. So in this presentation, Andrea is seeking feedback, um, any suggestions you have. Of course, you've got the reading calendar as well to do that. Um, but this is a great time to share your thoughts um, so they can be incorporated as we move forward. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Nice to see you again. For the record, Andrea Cantor, Economic Development Advisor in the Mayor's Office. As the Mayor stated, I'm kind of back to present on valet parking code updates. Last we kind of touched on this topic was February 27th at work session. And since then, we've made some adjustments based on the, the input provided. Um, as mayor had stated, I'm really seeking direction from council on both kind of the valet ordinance and the new valet fee that's being proposed. Uh, to bring us back just really quickly, I want to provide a little background. So with the growth and development of downtown, we know that there's been an increased interest from a variety of users, such as those seeking customer parking to loading zones to valet uh, within the right of way, especially in the downtown core. As surface lots have developed, we've heard from community, the community that the city should preserve public parking where possible while balancing the needs of the changing kind of businesses that we're seeing come to downtown. Specific to, to valet, um, for context, since 2011, we've really only had one active valet and no real inquiries. Um, and this is the one that serves several office tenants on 8th and Main. And as of today, we have both one active valet and two currently under review, which are really around kind of the main and 11th area, uh, both serve, would serve at the two new hotels in that area. Also, the only fee that we currently assign for valet is based on the annual license. And so there's no revenue collected, which I know we talked about last time. <clears throat> so staff outlined kind of three main goals to address these code changes for valet as we continue to see kind of interest uh, one of the goals was to kind of create specific criteria for the valet parking application, ask for a little bit more to demonstrate what the need was. Uh, goal two, to limit the use and approval of valet specific to hotels with limited or no on-site parking. And then goal three, just in exchange for the use of the public right-of-way to assign an annual fee to compensate the public for the loss of revenue. So based on our last discussion, I wanted to point out a few of the proposed changes made to the code that kind of address some of these goals and your input. So first, specific to the new fee, um, staff added that a measurement of 22 feet would be used um, if requested area was unmarked or there was no meter uh, previously there 
just to provide clarity on how we'll be measuring the right of way um, when assigning a fee. Next, staff added additional application requirements that included things like an applicant must submit a parking assessment to demonstrate how their hotel has a clear deficit of parking on site, which includes identifying the number of spaces on their property and identifying that other feasible options have been explored. Also, applicants uh, must provide a clear statement of need for valet within the right of way specific for their hotel operations. And then last, we also added that applicants must provide a parking plan and a copy of a signed agreement showing they've obtained parking at an offsite location to accommodate valet vehicles, which I know came up last time as well. All right, so on this slide, it just kind of outlines a little bit about how staff will handle the application review and decision. I wanted to highlight the code that the code will state that parking services shall review the submitted application and decide whether a permit should be approved. In addition, the city in its sole discretion can determine the appropriateness of a proposed area for valet and the number of spaces. Um, and then quickly, just before we move on to kind of the fees, I wanna note that staff is not proposing that these code changes impact the current valet uh, adjacent to Main Street Station, so that serves the office tenants or non-hotel use. Uh, it would be exempt from the, the hotel limitation, but would still apply for an annual license. Just a point of note. <clears throat> so on this slide, I just wanted to give council an idea of what the public parking rate structure looks like for the park boy garages, since we referenced that in our last discussion. This chart just shows an example of parking rates offered weekday, monthly, and yearly within the garages. The weekday rate is between $15 and $20 for one car. Um, so this kind of brings us to the discussion about assigning a value for the valet parking fee. So we're anticipating this be exclusive use of the public right-of-way for hotels to operate a valet. As mentioned previously, the valet license holders are only required to pay the annual license fee, which is around $105 for renewal or $290 for a new license. So this would be a new expense. On the slide, there's two proposed fee structures. They use a different number of days, as you can see in the chart, but each use a base rate of $15 a day. Uh, this is the same rate um, offered for special events and requested meter closures uh, which parking services re refers to as the meter hood rate. So in blue, kind of option one proposes a yearly rate of $5,475 per space by using $15 a day for 365 days. Um, so you could kind of say this is the, the premium rate, charges it each day for a full year. In green, kind of the second option proposes a yearly rate of $4,515 per space which uses $15 a day times 301 days. So taking out kind of holidays and Sundays, which is aligned with kind of how we operate some of the meters. So with that, um, for reference, the current valet operations likely will request two to three uh, spaces for valet. So the total fee would be probably two to three times this. This is just for one space or 22 feet, if you will. <clears throat> um, so just a little bit more than shown on this chart. So I'm happy to pause here or I can wrap up and come back. Madam Mayor, I have a question, Andrea. So sure. um, are the spaces, would there be reserved spaces for these cars in the garage or are they just park where they find a spot in the garage? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member, great question. So this is anticipating a uh, a valet operation in the right of way, and then it'll be the responsibility of the operator to, you know, take the keys, get in the car, and then relocate that vehicle elsewhere. Um, it could be in a garage or it could be in a surface lot, but we're anticipating they would need to secure parking offsite and make sure they have enough spots to accommodate the number of users they're anticipating. Thank you. Madam Mayor. When you, we talk about only being, you know, new licenses being awarded under this ordinance for uh, hotel hotel use. Does that mean a hotel can provide valet services as a hotel to anyone that comes up and uses them? Maybe someone just wants to use the restaurant there, or does it mean that the users that they allow 
that they service with their valet service have to be there at that hotel or using it for hotel purposes? Thank you for that question, Madam Mayor, Council Member. I think in the code, we're not specific to who the users are. We're specific to who is obtaining and um, applying for the license. So it would be, for example, one of our current ones would be that the Avery Hotel has applied for a valet operation. They will operate that valet to folks who come use it. I imagine they're anticipating most of the users will be coming to their hotel, but we're not, we don't call that out and say like, you must only be a guest of the hotel or um, we didn't get that granular on that. Questions, feedback? Um, yeah, if I could just weigh in on the proposed option one. I mean, I think it's important for us to recoup revenue here, but it's also important to, for us to reflect the value lost in the lost parking spot, even on days when we're not collecting revenue from that meter. So for that reason, I would be in support of an option one. Madam Mayor, question. Thank you for your presentation. What sort of feedback have you gotten from those who would apply and pay these kind of fees? What do they think? Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council Member, I think that's a great question. Hard to say. I don't necessarily, we haven't proposed this a, a fee to them. I think we've proposed the idea that we were working on changes and likely we'd be looking at about $15 a day, but not sure what that total would be. Um, currently, if they go to parking services to use a meter, the meter hood rate is $15 and then they determine how many days they can use it. So we haven't proposed this, this total amount. Um, I think there's some discussion around the use of the public right of way. And what I heard from council last time was like, we needed to recover costs. Um, and right now meters could potentially receive more revenue than what we're proposing in, in this fee. And in the past, just for um, background, like we had no policy. Uh, most of the time people were just saying no. It was kind of willy-nilly, right? And and we were hearing the requests of businesses downtown that we create a policy um, and enable this. And so then looked at the um, rate that those folks are paying today if, if for those that have it um, and looked at what that would mean to get a permit for a year. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, follow-up. Because this is a fee is there a public hearing associated with that how does what is the process to implement this given that there's uh, it's a monetary issue yes uh, madam mayor council member great question in my next step slides we do just spell out that what we're anticipating is scheduled for first reading for the ordinance you and can then go also a public why don't you go ahead and move okay. to that so we can see it so here we go <laughs> so for april 9th we're anticipating a public hearing for the new fee um, and then the ordinance to go on first reading and have the subsequential three readings. Um, Madam Mayor, one more follow-up. Have you, um, I know you're seeking direction here first, but I'm curious if you have talked to the Downtown Association and their thoughts on this. Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council Member, great question. We have engaged with the DBA on this topic probably over the last two years. We had a couple different outreach sessions and um, town halls with business owners specifically around kind of the main and 11th area. And what we heard was that kind of preservation of public right of way, especially for metered parking. Last year, the council helped us make changes from four hour to two hour metered parking in response to business owners saying like, we really need this kind of customer turn and use. Um, so with that, I don't think that there was support or desire from the business owners to see valet, for example. And so I think that kind of instituted where we see a value for valet as a parking management tool. You know, if a hotel is going to have 200 rooms and a couple event centers, like three meters out front may not adequately serve the public or the businesses. So what's another way that we can get cars in and out quicker? And so it's that balancing between the use of the meter and providing this as a service for the, for a different type of business, like a hotel. Um, so we did have discussions. We heard DBA wasn't necessarily in support of valet, but I think they'd be in support of it as a way to serve more users and kind of help downtown continuous circulation. Um, Madam Mayor, um, I guess I've got a question. I apologize if you've answered this already. Will the meters where these places are going to be, are they going to stay in place? So like they may not be using all the valet one day or are we going to pull the meters out and like, boom, 
this is valet forever? Madam Mayor, Council Member, great question. With uh, applying for a valet license and uh, paying the fee, the parking services would remove the meters. So in effect, this becomes exclusive use to that hotel to operate a valet and potentially charge a fee for that use. And so that's where some of the fee calculation came in as well. We're removing meters and it then becomes exclusive use of that hotel to operate their valet within the hours that they they would like to. Yeah, Madam Mayor, just following up there, thank you for that clarification. That's super helpful. Um, I guess if meters were staying in place and like the picture that we see right here, there were some valet things that were being popped up, we would charge them for however many days that they're going to use it. I think that those parking spots have value every single day that they're being used. And if they're being removed from the street, should probably have value yes. 365 days out of the year, more if it's a leap year. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess I would be more towards that option. One is that like, this is real value every single day that it gets to be used. And if we're taking those away from the public, then there should be some sort of cost every day that goes with it. If they weren't using them all the time, and then there was the media that was there, then like that'd be a different story. So that's where I'm at. Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Oh, Council Member Morales. And then I think I heard Nash. I, I appreciate the, the second proposal and kind of your comments about like thinking about valet as a public good in and of, a, in and of itself, because like you said, if we don't allow a valet spot, now we have the same number of metered spots that everyone will be fighting for. But if we can remove a large group of users from that fight, because now they have valet through their hotel reservation, uh, now we're actually freeing up more spots, hypothetically, in that block for residents to be able to enjoy uh, by taking those customers off of the streets. And so I think, I think there is a balance here in terms of what what more public good are you going to get? I think you're going to get more public good from getting all of those customers into a garage somewhere else than fighting for spots like they are now. So, I mean, I think I personally with that, and I'd be curious if, if others feel that way, um, you know, kind of makes me think that we should be making this available a little bit easier to, to those that, that we approve. That's just my thought. Madam Mayor. Yeah, uh, Andrea, is there anything in here that would constitute us conveying like a property right that would extend longer than a year? Uh, it would be important to me that we don't cede anything longer than that. I don't know if anybody's kept track of how the city of Chicago uh, privatized mm -hmm. their um, public parking and it's going to cost them billions. So it would be important to me that we weren't be giving any way parking spots longer than a year uh, should we need to reclaim those at a later date. Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council President, great point. Our, the, the license in our code would be for one year unless uh, abandoned, revoked, and some other language with that. So we're not anticipating that this would be for longer than a one year period. Madam Mayor, um, I, oh. um, if you, I think you're asking us for direct feedback on the two, I would support option one. I think both of these are great proposals. I don't think um, a $900 difference is really gonna make or break it for these businesses, but I do want it to be you know, this is the community is in a sense like giving up these quick. I mean, I know I use the metered parking all the time and giving up that quick option. Um, and as council member Holly Burton said, it is 365 days a week that that will be having an impact on the community and the downtown community. Um, so I, I support making it like a little bit more of a commitment for those businesses to move, to move that forward. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thanks again for the presentation. And I, I appreciated, um, council member Hallie Burton's question. I mean, at the end of the day, they're buying this space mm -hmm. and if they're going to buy it, they got to pay. And, uh, if there isn't an opportunity to pick and choose, then I think it has to be commiserate with what it would be no matter who's parking there. Hmm. So I vacillate between option one and option two because we don't charge for those days. But I think given that it's a premium space, I'd like, I'd like to see what the public thinks about option one um, and then go from there. 
Madam Mayor, Council Member, thank you. I do want to note, just as I've been working with parking services on this, trying to understand kind of how we value our meters in terms of a per meter value, I do want to note that at full occupancy, you know, 12 hours a day that we operate the meters, I believe they're valued at $35. But there's a lot of other factors that go into this. So just want to make sure to put that record as um, this is at a little bit lower rate, but again, at a lower or if you went with option one over 365 days, and I'm sure not all of our meters are occupied, you know, all the time at the rate. Um, so anyway, thank you for the feedback, uh, Council. I, we will have a public hearing uh, next week. Um, we've invited the current valet license holders or the applicants uh, to to be aware and to join us as well. So if they there are further input, we'd, we'd hope they'd um, come on the record. Uh, UC Santa is here with us today uh, on behalf of the Renegade. So it's nice to know that we have people tracking this topic and, and helping put their comments on the record if, if they'd like to. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. And our final presentation, um, I've asked Courtney Washburn to share an overview of our ARPA, American Rescue Plan, Act funds um, and the strategy. A couple questions have come up. Um, we've, I, I want to make sure everybody understands that when we receive these funds and actually in advance of receiving these funds, um, we compiled a grants team um, and, and a whole bunch of folks in the city. And we did a lot of public outreach to the community because we decided that we were going to put at least 30% of these funds into the community, receive that information. And then the council at the time created buckets. Um, and those buckets are where now as we deploy the funds and the final remaining funds that we have, you're seeing them come back, but, but they fit in one of those buckets that the council had approved. And all of this work that's been done was to ensure that we are tracking and able to report out that we've spent the funds correctly. And our forever focus and intent with these dollars has been to spend them all for the benefit of Boiseans and not send them back. Um, as we've seen the state and others do with some of them. So uh, this is the year where the where the rest of them have to get funded. Courtney's going to share um, the kind of some of the background and the, and the history of the buckets and how we came to be the work that we're that is being done and what we might see moving forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For the record, I'm Courtney Washburn. I'm the chief of staff for the city. It's nice to be um, before you all today. So as the mayor mentioned, I'm going to take you back in the time machine to uh, 2021. Um, my goal in this presentation is to um, start from the beginning. Um, you've made several decisions associated with ARPA, and I'm not sure um, the city done its best job of starting back in 2021 when some of you are not here and how we decided um, to do what we're implementing today. Um, it's as with all the work I present to council, I do not do this alone. So there are a team of people at the city of Boise who work on this and know far more than I do. Um, I'm trying to stay high level um, in order to help orient you to the decisions of today based on the decisions of the past. So with that, I'll get started. So the American Rescue Plan, um, it was $1.9 trillion in economic relief signed into law in 2021. The city received $36.9 million and an additional $2.9 in home allocation and $8.8 .8 in ERAP funding. The airport also received $6 million in airport improvement program. And I'm going to go get some water. I'll be right back. The money was allocated um, in two tranches, and then the current money we have must be obligated by the end of this year and spent by um, December 31st, 2026. So um, this is a slimmed down version of the federal funding guidelines. Um, as the mayor mentioned, um, one of our guiding principles was to make sure we were fully compliant with all the federal federal guidelines associated with this money. Um, but here, the overarching features 
and the guiding principles from the federal government associated with these funds. So the first thing the city did was do a comprehensive community outreach strategy. We did an online survey from September to December and did three community um, listening sessions from November till December. And these were some of the highlights um, from those community outreach events. Um, you can see that people really wanted immediate relief, but wanted to make sure the short-term investments led um, to long-term sustainable projects. And that um, there was a tendency, I think, just in the national narrative to fund new things with this um, ARPA funding. Um, our community clearly wanted more of the good services we provided, and they were not as into new ideas at this period of time. If you all remember where we were in 2021, um, service delivery efficiently and effectively to those who needed it most um, was the theme of the day. So the city came up with guiding principles that was to align the mayor and the council's priorities to allow the opportunity for matching funds within the community to provide an ability um, to pass funds directly to the community and then to create an opportunity to track and measure long-term impact. And what we did to prioritize these projects is we hired Jacobs to support the prioritization of the projects. The community outreach and guiding principles were aligned with the department priorities and the city project portfolios. So this is where the city's, you know, department priorities were matched um, with the feedback from the community. And then Barry Dunn was hired to make sure um, we followed the compliance guidelines. And I believe um, that is still in place today until we expend all the funds. Yeah, Madam Mayor and uh, Courtney, could you tell me more about who Jacobs and Barry Dunn are and why the city felt it was important to um, have some uh, consultation on these allocations? Sure. Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member, um, firstly, we needed um, consulting support. Um, the city had not um, been in a position to receive 36 point whatever I said, million dollars. It was a bit overwhelming to our teams. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we used an outside consultant that could both match the community priorities, the city's portfolio, and had an eye towards compliance. And then we got, um, we doubled down in compliance. I don't know if you recall, again, we're going back to 2021, but there were stories coming associated with this money with folks that were not paying as much attention to compliance. So the city wanted to make sure it dotted its I's and crossed its T's. And these um, uh, associated contracts were approved by previous councils. So in 2022, the city formed its funding approach. The buckets, if you will, were created. So affordable housing, climate adaptation, community projects, broadband, and administrative costs. Um, these buckets have remained the same. The amounts in them um, have changed. So just a reminder, our internal portfolio projects that were funded were Connect Our Parks, our housing projects and clean energy projects. So these were the top priorities internally of the city based on the feedback from the community. And then our community portfolio of projects were really focused on childcare, small businesses, mental health and food security. And then here's the current breakout of those buckets. Um, we do expect to make some more adjustments between these funds um, in order to ensure that we can, um, as the mayor said, leave no money on the table with the deadlines that are coming up. Um, how these are fluctuating um, is really important. In some cases, we guessed what the community might want, let's say in the small business grants, and perhaps it didn't come in as that much. You, you mean we guessed or estimated the yes. totals. Yes. We knew that they were wanting grants. People yes. were very involved in that, but we were having to approximate how much we might be able to grant out. 
Correct. And then um, good news, the administrative costs were not what we predicted. So I believe you recently moved some of that money um, into housing, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so what we're still doing in ARPA is figuring out what the best projects we can do with the completion deadline and then um, move the money in between these buckets. But I wanted to try to give you a clear picture. These buckets have never changed. Um, they were based on the compliance advice, the community outreach, the, the um, city's portfolio um, in developing these. So these have held firm um, since 2021. Um, with that, I'd stand for any questions. Madam Mayor, uh, Courtney, could you help, could you walk me through some of these deadlines associated with the funding? Does the funding need to be allocated by a certain date? It seems like that might have been on a previous federal budget ruling that funds need to be allocated for a certain purpose. Do they need to be spent down to zero by the end of the year under contract by the end of the year? Give me an idea of what we can expect there. Sure, Madam Mayor, Council Member, the money must be obligated by December 31st, 2024 and spent by December 31st, 2026. And for clarity, obligated, do we think that means under contract or do we think that means there's been some internal decision made at the city or for that purpose? Hey, Mayor, Chloe gonna... Ross Ronan's coming up. Chloe was deeply involved in all of this um, back in those days. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council President Nash. Obligated, um, the other, the official term that the government was using was encumbered. And the way that we have interpreted that and the way that um, our budget department has um, encumbered those dollars is both in contracts that we have where the money is a, a purchase order that has been set aside um, or in um, and this is where we need our Bill Moria or in a specific fund that we have do documented or specifically set aside for these projects. At council direction in previous budgets so is would, how we did it. Would it be fair to say that obligated or encumbered means that it's either under contract or set aside in a dedicated funding source at council direction? Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. And then the the other key part of that is, and so this obligation piece is if we know that um, we won't be spending money in one of those buckets because a program that we estimated had extra money, like the small business grants, then we need to re-obligate it to another program within one of those buckets um, by the end of December. And then th the next key piece is that it's got to be spent. So um, our departments have to be ready to spend it. And that's why Courtney pointed out that we might, some of those numbers um, between the buckets might change based on timing of projects, at which case we determine you know, where it could go, what's ready to be spent that's still appropriate, and then we'd backfill with other funds when the project that we've already planned for is ready. So, Madam Mayor, do you feel like funds could not be re-obligated or switch buckets after December 31st, 2024? Yes. That's our read of it, yeah. And do we, what do we feel like, what risks do we run by having funds that are maybe dedicated but not under contract by the end of the year? Like, are there risks associated with that, with potentially losing the funds? Madam Mayor, Council President Nash, I think if I'm answering your question correctly, the risk would be that we have obligated the money, um, but it is then uh, we are unable to spend it. So in those years of 25 and 26, whatever may happen, um, the project doesn't go through, then the money is left on the table and we have to send it back. Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. um, well, first, don't take us back to 2021. Mm -hmm. It was not a fun time. Uh, can you go up a couple of slides that shows the buckets? If I remember correctly, I think our community projects buckets, those also had some limitations on on really how we could use the funds. And I think I'm remembering that they had to do with mental health, child care, and I think local food. Were those the three kind of categories that fit underneath community projects? Yes, we, so the, the original 
um, slide that outlined what the federal guidelines were really really kind of drives home and we continue to drive home that we must be addressing the adverse impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. So as these community projects were put together, all, all roads needed to lead back to serving those who had been adversely um, or negatively impacted. And in all instances, we needed to document that the, that the people, the individuals, or the businesses um, that were receiving the dollars had been adversely impacted. So then you get even deeper where it's like they live in a, um, a specific census tract that falls within these specific guidelines, or you can, you can prove in an alternative way that, um, that they were a vulnerable group or had been impacted in another way. Thank you. And then the, the, the sub buckets or sub categories that we see here, that's money that we've already spent or that's money that we've committed to spending. I think that there's maybe some of those that we're still waiting on the final dollar amount. So those could go up or potentially down a little bit. Madam Mayor, Council Member Halliburton, that's true. We have allocated all, we've spent all of the childcare. We made a donation to Treasure Valley YMCA. All of the small business grants have been allocated. And then the mental health um the mental health programs are now invoicing us and spending those dollars down. Um, and the food security is the same way we've, we've um, encumbered that 1.5 and they are spending it down um, on a monthly basis. Perfect. Thank you. Madam Mayor, um, it seems like it's been the practice with, to come before council if we need to re-obligate funds. It seems like we did that with the a hotel contract, would you anticipate if funds need to move buckets between now and the end of the year that those would be those changes would be presented to council? Yeah, because it's actually technically an interim budget change. So I'm I'm thinking about, you know, if there's a project in well, broadband was spent. So let's say climate adaptation, there's all of this money has been obligated um, in budgets, in past budgets. So it would be an interim budget change if say uh, let's do it the other way. We saw that we weren't going to, and we knew by the end of the year, we weren't going to be able to spend all of our affordable housing bucket money, but it already been budgeted that way. So we would come back with an interim budget change to then move into one of these other buckets if we had a shovel-ready project that we were certain we'd be able to spend the money on. Sure, go ahead. Madam Mayor. Um, Chloe, Courtney, thank you very much for this presentation. As, as a new council member coming in, um, knowing that we have these ARPA one-time dollars available, most of which have been allocated per the project timeline, and seeing that we had had some recently shift different buckets, this is really helpful information, and I appreciate you taking the time and the work to go back and educate us, even if it's to 2021, where we don't want to be at, <laughs> <Don't> uh, <laughs> to provide this information. Um, it, it's, it's helpful, and it, it's resourceful, and I thank you for taking the time to do that. Madam Mayor, Council Member, my pleasure. When I um, sat through the last presentation on ARPA, I thought, should I just, like, jump up and try to explain the buckets, but sometimes it makes staff nervous when I do that. Um, so I am happy to return today to explain, you know, 2021 and how we got here today. Um, one follow-up question. So as we, we start getting closer to these deadlines in 2025, uh, is it a possibility to maybe have a reporting out of it like a six months basis just to see where we're at and if there's any actions that need to be taken? Because um, as you said, maybe we started down a project and then we see, wow, we hit a roadblock. There's no way we're going to spend those funds. We will. What I would commit to you rather than a six-month report is because we wouldn't want to wait for that six-month report. Um, I've directed staff this year to be clear if, when they know that they've had a budget allocation that's tied to ARPA funds um, to true up the timing of it, whether or not it's ripe. And if it's not, we're going to immediately move it into something. Um, and you would see that at that time because we need to do an interim budget change. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And I can't um, thank enough Chloe, who's here, um, and the team of people that worked with her at the city. And then we, the community engagement work, it was both, it was fun and challenging because, I mean, we many of us sat through, I know Jimmy was there at some, I was at some, sat through, 
um, evenings with all sorts of different people from the community and hearing about the needs of the time. And it was heart wrenching. It was, and it was a new, uh, a time when we were all newly coming back together um, and the impacts of uh, rising housing costs, pandemic, separation, et cetera, were just all right in front of us. And the, I appreciate the hundreds of people that showed up to share their stories and needs that like really pushed the city to innovate and be creative about how we use this funding to further our goals to meet community needs, but also do things faster that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And then importantly, to get funds out into the community. Um, we That was unique for us when we look at other uh, uses of ARPA in the state and region. Um, and that was only made possible because of all the people that engaged and the team that we had. And so while I wish we would keep having funds like this infused, we could move so many things more quickly, I deeply appreciate that we had this once in generation opportunity with these funds, um, coupled with the community engagement team we had at the city um, to put these to work for Boise. And with that, I'll take a motion for exec. Madam Mayor, I'd, mo I'd move that we go into executive executive session to discuss pending profitable litigation uh, pursuant to Idaho Code 74206-1BCDFIJ. Second. We have a motion and a second. Clerk? Morales. Yes. Nash. Yes. Dead. Yes. Willits. Yes. Corliss. Yes. Halliburton. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Thanks. We will be back at six.